the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Yes, every knee will bow before Him So open up the gates, make way Good morning, Rio Church, and can I say happy Mother's Day? You know, when you think about moms and all that they do, they really are quite amazing. Um, you know, not just because they have the ability to give us life, but because they have to put up with us without killing us, right? I mean, it's actually really amazing if you think about it. If you thought you were like an easy child growing up, the chances are that you weren't, and that instead you really just had a mom with a great amount of patience, right? Um, you know, I, just as an example, I, using my own mom, um, you know, when I was growing up, we lived on a couple acres of land just north of Roswell, and um, I would always invite my friends over, and we would get into so many different shenanigans that put us at odds with my mom. Like, I remember one time, um, my friend brought his potato gun over, which is exactly what it sounds like, and instead of shooting potatoes, we would find any random object that we could fit into the barrel, and we would shoot it into the sky, and there were multiple occasions we almost hit the house and faced the wrath of my mom. Um, another, you know, every 4th of July, really, um, we would have Roman candle wars and threaten to catch things on fire that were near and dear to my mother's heart. Um, and she didn't kill us for that either, or the, there was the time that, uh, you know, we had a BB gun, and my friend and I were going around shooting at random things that we found in our uh, house, or not in our house, but in our uh, yard, and um, one time my uh, friend actually shot something, and when we found what it was, it turns out it happened to be my mom's favorite coffee mug that she had happened to set down in the yard when she was watering it earlier that day, and yet... I am still alive and my mom 
still loves me. And so I just wanted to take a second and say thank you to each and every mom out there, and most especially to my mom. I love you. Thank you for putting up with me and taking care of me all these years. And I'd also like to say happy Mother's Day to my baby mama, Ari. Love you so much. I'm really thankful that I get to be dad and you get to be mom for our little girl. And um, you know what? If she turns out to be half the woman that you are, I think we're going to be just fine. So happy Mother's Day. And um, hey, if you have the opportunity, call your mom if you haven't already and say happy Mother's Day. Tell her how much you love her, how much you care for her, and for all that she's done. Say thank you. Yeah? And hey, you know what? I just want to keep up with the festivities of the day, and I just want to let you know that today in our study, we're going to be actually hearing from a mom in the story that we're going to look at, and not just any mom, um, but we're going to be looking at a mom who was a judge for Israel and acted as a mom in her uh, time as judge. Um, that's right, we're returning to our study in the book of Judges. We've had a long break, but I'm excited to jump back into it. And, and so I want to invite you guys today to open up to the book of Judges chapter 5. And while you find your place there, I, I just want to give you a brief recap on kind of the, the background of this book. Um, you see, Judges is a historical book that documents the darkness and depravity of the human heart, specifically that of the Israelite people, but it also documents the beauty of the love that God has for his people. Um, it, it documents what a lot of people have referred to as the sin cycle of Israel, and they call it a cycle because it keeps on repeating itself throughout the book of Judges. And, and this is kind of an overview of what the sin cycle looks like in the book of Judges. Um, God has his people, the Israelites, they're in a relationship together, they're in a kind of covenant together, but um, at some point in their history, the um, Israelite people forget their God, they snub the covenant that they're in, and they turn to idols and start worshiping them. At which point God, because he loves his people, seeks to teach them a lesson. He disciplines them, and it usually looks something like allowing them to uh, face, uh, go off and, and uh, chase their idols, and eventually an invading army comes and oppresses the people. And God, what he usually does there, and the kind of the point behind this is, hey, listen, um, if you want to worship these other false idols, I'll go ahead and let you worship them, but you can also look to them when you need help. And we'll see what happens then. And of course, um, nothing happens. You know, every time the Israelites get oppressed by these foreign enemies, the idols have no power because they're not real and they do not come to rescue them. And so after a little while and after they've been oppressed for some time, it usually ends up that the Israelites remember their God, cry out to him, to him and, and that's the point at which God rescues his people. And in the book of Judges, he rescues them specifically by sending a judge to them. This judge leads them into victory. And after they are rescued, they experience a season of renewed faith and peace with their God and the people around them. But like I said, it's a cycle, and so it doesn't take very long after this cycle appears to repeat itself and the people of God forget their God again and slip back into idolatry. This is basically the book of Judges in a nutshell, this sin cycle. And we've just been looking at this, and we've actually kind of gone through several different cycles as portrayed through this book. And, and the last time we were actually studying in the book of Judges, we were in chapter 4, and we learned about Deborah, Barak, and Jael. And let me tell you, it was intense, all right? And, and pun intended, I apologize for using it not once but twice. It's funny. Sue me, all right? Um, but, but anyways, um, if you remember this story, then you would remember and know that there were three people who played a vital part heart in delivering God's people from the clutches of the Chaldeans. We have Deborah, who was the judge, and she was a prophetess for the people, and she led the nation in wisdom. It was Deborah who called Barak to lead the armies of Israel in a fight against Sisera and his chariots, 900 iron chariots. And um, we talked about this the last time we were in this study, that chariots would have been the equivalent of like a tank today. And so he had 900 of them, and it made 
made them a very, very crazy and intense army to face off against. And yet Barak, we see, has great faith and courage, and he goes into battle, and we see that he defeats Sisera's army. In fact, Judges chapter 4, verse 16 says that Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Herosheth Hagayim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword, and not a man was left. And so Barak, you see, leads the army, and they win a decisive victory. Not a single person was left. All right, so he, he did good. He fought and defeated this army. Um, but we find out um, in verse 17 that Sisera, the general of this army, actually was able to escape. And when he runs off, he actually runs straight to the tent of Jael, um, the Kenite woman who happens to be friends of, uh, with Israel. And so when you continue reading the story, you find um, it, it, Jael, um, in a shocking move, is able to win Sisera's trust, lull him into a sense of security, and then quite literally nail him to the floor using a tent peg, right? It's a crazy, crazy story. In verse 21, it kind of gives us the details, and it says that Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand, and then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness, and so he died. Exactly. I mean, it, tent peg through the temple, you're probably going to die, right? But it, this is just one of those kind of crazy stories I like to tell to mid-schoolers because it's gross and gruesome and, and it's just kind of interesting. And, and so that's the story that we get in chapter four. Now, Judges definitely has kind of a rhythm and a cycle to it built into it. And so normally, um, the way that Judges is written, it's this point in the story when, when normally the story would just be over. Right? Because God and his people are victorious. Um, Sisera is dead, and King Jabin has been taken care of. God's people are following God once more, um, and they're in re right relationship with him. And, and, and this, again, this is the point that we should be reading something along the lines of the land had rest for 40 years or something like that. That's what we should read. But that doesn't happen in this story. You see, after chapter 4 ends, instead of just ending and starting a new story following new judges and new heroes and things like that, it continues on telling the story in chapter 5 through a song. It's a song that Deborah and Barak um, sing together and is recorded in chapter 5. And it, it, it's really, it's kind of like uh, uh, the director's commentary on, on like a DVD. Have you guys ever gotten a DVD and, and, you know, on the bonus features, you see where you can watch the movie with the director's commentary on so you can see, um, you know, they'll explain to you why they used, what shots they used and that kind of stuff. See, that, that's kind of what um, um, this is. You know, I personally, I've never really watched anything like that. Um, I just, I'm not interested in learning about that. But some people really like to watch the director's cut and, and put the director's commentary on as they watch a movie. And, and I guess I can understand why. It makes sense. Um, usually the director's cut, the director's commentary includes a lot of hidden details about the story and the shots that are used versus the shots that weren't used and didn't make it into the final cut. But, um, you know, so watching a, a movie with the director's commentary on gives you the story behind the story. And a lot of people find that to be interesting. And, and listen, like, like that's what Judges chapter five is. Judges chapter five is like watching Judges chapter four with the director's commentary turned on. And, and, and again, it's just very interesting. Judges chapter 5, is, it's a poem written by Deborah and sung by her and Barak that retells the events of chapter 4, only this time it highlights for us the fact that God was involved at every step of the process and he was working in the background. He is the story behind the story. And so when we read chapter 5, we're going to see that while Deborah called upon Israel to fight and, and Barak rode into battle and Jael applied the finishing blow to Sisera, that it was actually God who was working in and through his people to rescue them from their oppressors the entire time. And so I just kind of thought it might be fun on this Mother's Day um, if we would just go back and rewatch the story of Deborah and Barak, only this time we're going to have the director's commentary turned on, and we're going to discover all the different ways God was working behind the scenes. All right, so if that sounds cool to you, then let's go ahead and get started. We're going to just start at the very beginning, the opening scene. 
If you have your Bibles, hopefully you found your way to Judges chapter uh, 5 by now, and we're going to start chapter uh, in verse 1. It, it says this. It says, uh, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, the leaders that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Right, so this movie, so to speak, begins with uh, Deborah and Barak calling us to praise. Right? It's right there in the end of verse 2 where they say, bless the Lord. Right? The reason um, they're calling us to bless the Lord, the, the reason that they have been um, led to praise God is that, that the leaders took the lead in Israel and that the people offered themselves willingly. Now, that does not sound like a very big deal when you read it at first, right? Like she was led to break out in song because people did stuff, right? Like she's praising God and she's led to worship because leaders led. Isn't that what leaders are supposed to do is, is, is lead? What's so amazing that led her into a, a, a time of worship about the fact that the leaders of Israel led? Well, let me tell you that it is actually kind of amazing, right? Because if you, like me, have ever tried to get volunteers to show up in a school cafeteria at 7 a.m. to do manual labor, and they show up and have a smile on their face, then you know how amazing it really is, right? This verse tells us that the leaders of Israel led, and they did it willingly, meaning they didn't do it out of obligation. They were not voluntold that they, they wanted to do this, it reminds me of when I put my two-year-old daughter to bed every night. Like nine times out of ten, when we get her ready for bed, we know it's going to be a battle, that there are going to be tears, there might have to be a spanking. I mean, gray hairs just kind of like pop out of my head at an exponential rate every night I have to put my daughter down for bed. But, but the other day, right, um, we went to put her to bed. I was readying myself for battle, but, but she didn't fight us. She, she didn't fight us. She just went to bed. She did everything we asked her to do. And, and I just remember we put her down. I prayed with her and I went outside of the room, closed the door. And I just put my ear up against the door waiting for her to have a meltdown because there's got to be a meltdown, right? This is a fight. This is a battle. But, but the, the meltdown never came. She just went to sleep. And let me tell you, I praised the Lord because it was amazing, right? This two-year-old just did what I asked. I mean, I cannot believe it. Like somebody needs to give me some kind of award. Like this has to be a first. You know, it, it was really amazing and it stirred up worship within my heart. And that's kind of sort of what's going on here in this verse. Because when you think about the whole premise of the book of Judges, the, the whole point behind Judges is, is it's, it revolves around God's people rebelling against and repressing their belief in Him. So for them to actually do what they were asked to do is nothing short of a miracle. And that is exactly what Deborah wants us to see. That the fact that while Deborah may have been the one who issued the call for God's people to rise up and go to battle, um, that, that's true. She wants us to see, though, that and, and to understand that even though she did the asking, it was God who moved in their hearts and caused them to act with a willing heart. See, that's who God is. That's what God does. That's what she wants us to see. She wants us to understand that God is a mover and a shaper of people's hearts. You see it throughout the scripture. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says that the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Proverbs 16 9 says that the heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. Meaning God moves in the hearts of people, molding, shaping, and directing them. Right? Even in the New Testament, in John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Right? So what we're learning, and I think what Deborah's trying to highlight for us, is that God moves in the hearts of men, guiding, shaping, drawing us into his presence. And no, he does not force people to have faith in him because we are not supposed to be robots who just follow orders, but he does have the power to move and influence us and the things that we do to accomplish his plans. And that is exactly what we see him doing here. 
All Deborah wants us to know is, is that it was God who did it and it should be God who gets the credit. It was really him who caused the response that we see happening from the people in this story. You know, and it's, it's true now even, right? I, I want you to know that, that he does this still. He moves and he works in our hearts. I want you to know that if you find yourself watching this video out of curiosity and that you're skeptical about this whole Jesus thing, I just want you to know and give you fair warning that God is after you right now. Like, just honestly, like, like his desire is for you. And the fact that you're watching this is just one of the ways that he is working in your life. And I just get fair warning. You might, you might become a Christian, right? You just, you might, right? That's how God works. That's what he does. I might be the one delivering the message, but if anything happens because of this message, all the glory goes to God because I'm just the mouthpiece. God is the one who changes hearts. And so I just wanted to let you know that still happens today. God softens people's hearts and they respond willingly to his call. And for that, he is worthy of praise. That's what Deborah wants us to see. But we've barely scratched the surface of this director's commentary. And, and the scene from here shifts from looking at the people of God and their response to the battle that they had to fight. And we're given a few more details about this battle that we didn't have in the original cut of the story. If you look at verse 4, uh, you're, you're going to find that there's a few more details here. In verse 4, it says, The Lord, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. See, these two verses tell us that God, whenever the, the people of God were on the move, God went with him. That as they marched, so did he, and, and they could feel his presence because it was as if the earth itself were trembling. Even beyond the earth itself quaking underneath their feet, it tells us in verse 4 that there was rain falling. Now, um, that kind of gives this whole battle a Helm's Deep kind of feel, you know, like the rain's coming down and so it begins and they go into battle, right? But, but it turns out that the rain is more than a random detail. The rain is actually a very important and relevant detail to this story. Because if you look back in chapter 4, um, you don't know that there's rain. In chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, it says that Deborah, and Bar uh, Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? And so Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. So, you know, here in this account, it doesn't say anything about rain. It doesn't mention it at all. Um, it, it kind of sounds as if the way God was involved in the battle was by supernaturally strengthening Barak and his army to go and beat these 10,000 chariots, despite the fact that they were basically tanks. But, but if you skip to um, chapter 5 in verse 19, you'll see that God was far more involved in this story and in this battle than we previously realized. If you look at chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, you'll see that it says this. In verse 19, it says, The kings came, they fought, and then fought the kings of Canaan at Taanach by the waters of Megiddo. But they got no spoils of silver. In other words, they didn't win like they expected to. And why? Why didn't they win? Well, it says that from heaven, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. From the torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, march on my soul with might. And so, so what all does this mean? Well, it's actually kind of interesting. You see, here's what happened in this director's cut. We find out that the rain God sends in verse 4 of chapter 5, as the army charged downhill towards Sisera, ended up flooding the Kishon River, which happened to be where Sisera had lined up his chariots. And that as the river ro rose, it swept those chariots away so that if any of them remained at all, they were stuck in the mud and made Sisera and his army a bunch of sitting ducks. And all the, the Barak had to do and all the Israelites had to do was go and chase them down. And Timothy Keller uh, put it like this. He says, The God who rules nature, even the stars, was fighting against the Canaanites in verse 20. 
And verse 21 reveals how it was that Sisera's unbeatable chariots were rendered useless. The God who made the clouds pour down water in verse 4 caused the river to flood, sweeping them away as Barak advanced in verse 21. Now, Sisera Sisera never would have arranged his chariots next to a river if he had been expecting rain. This must have been the dry season, not the wet. But God, through Deborah, told Israel just where to fight in chapter 4, verse 6, luring Sisera's army to the place where he would then destroy them. In other words, um, in this director's cut, in this director's commentary, we learn that the reason the, the Israelites were able to beat the chariots is because God swept them away with the river. Yes, Barak swung the sword, but it was God who swept the chariots away using the flood. And, and I think that it's important to Deborah, that we understand that it was God who fought this battle, not necessarily his people. It's important for us to understand that God gets the glory because God did the work in this story. And you know what? I think that's true for you and for me in our lives. Every victory we, every victory we have and, and everything that happens in our life, there is the part that we play, but then there's also the part that God plays. And, and God is doing a lot more than we may realize or understand. John Piper said it like this once. He said, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. The idea that he's trying to get across and the idea that I think is inherent within this story is that there is a story behind every story and God is at work even in our mess. He's always doing something. Right? Barak had a lot of faith. He, he, he really did. But God likes to work in and through our faith. And so when Barak stepped out against the 900 chariots of iron, when he made his move in faith, God met him in that place and fought on his behalf. And and I just want to point out that the same thing is true for you and for me, that God may be working in and through you in your life, calling you to do things that are difficult and scary and painful. But I want you to know that if you'll step out in faith, if it's really the Lord that's calling you to do these things, if you step out in faith, that he will meet you in your mess and he will do something good through you if you have faith. And, and, and I just, I think it's important for us to understand that there are always, there's always a story behind the story. That, that there's what we see on the outside. There's the difficult circumstances that we find ourselves in and it's always scary and it's hard. But then there's the story happening underneath. There's the God who's at work behind it all, filling everything we do with meaning. And so I, I just want to just tell you, like, Bear, uh, like Deborah does in the last line of verse 21, I just want to say, march on my soul with might. God goes with you, so have faith. He is moving through the mess to bring about his glory and your good. All you have to do is have a little faith, even if it's difficult, even if you can't see what's going on. He is there and he is working, I promise. Now, that's not all, though, that we get to see. The scene shifts yet again. And it takes us away, uh, it takes us away from the battle itself, and it takes us back to the oppression that Israel experienced at the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, and his army general, Sisera. And, and hidden within these verses that we're about to read is a, a story that is it's, it's kind of a, a, an Easter egg, and it leads us, uh, it's kind of a special Mother's Day Easter egg hidden within this story. And so I, 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 I like Easter eggs. Um, this is part of one of the things that I like about Marvel movies the most is the little Easter eggs they leave throughout the movie that if you're paying close enough attention that you'll see hints uh, of how there's more to the story hidden within. Like I, I remember watching Iron Man for the first time and thinking, wait a second, is that Captain America's shield on his workbench right there? Or that one post credit scene where you get to see Thor's hammer for the first time, or, or the moment you realize Peter Parker's grandfa- uh, principal is the grandson of one of Captain America's howling commandos, right? Like all those Easter eggs are just exciting and fun. And listen, I know that, that nerd stuff isn't for everyone, so if you tuned out, I'm now like, tuned back in, pay attention, okay, because um, my nerd rant is over, and my point is this. All right, um, there are Easter eggs hidden in this story that point us to the special relevance that mothers have in our lives. And I think that's kind of interesting. And and Deborah um, starts to give us, she gives us our first Easter egg in uh, Judges chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. 
If you look with me, it says this, In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned and travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. See, um, these verses describe the way things were under the oppression of Jabin and Sisera. It says that they were bad. They were bad. People couldn't travel on the highways because they were afraid of bandits and the foreign occupying forces. No one trusted anyone because it was kind of a, it was so bad. It was an every man for himself kind of thing. And, and so village life ceased. Community didn't exist. And Israel under the oppression of Jabin and Sisera looked a lot more like a post-apocalyptic scene than it did the thriving place where the people of God lived. And it says that that's how things were for a long time. That is until Deborah showed up. And she says in verse 7 that when she showed up, she showed up as a mother in Israel. And I think that this means that she was, yes, she was a prophetess. That was the role, that was the, the office that she held, that was her function. But she wants us to know that the way that she judged, the way that she worked and spoke and served her people was like a mother would serve and speak to her children. And I think that that tells us a lot of different things, among which um, um, is the fact that Israel in this season needed a mom. It is someone to come in and, and mother them. Right? It, it, the, the Bible puts a lot of weight into the role a mother plays in their child's life. In Proverbs 1 verse 8, it is expected of children to listen to their mother's teaching, which means it is the mother's job, at least in part, to teach her children. Deuteronomy 21 verses 18 and 19 explains that it is the responsibility of the father and of the mother to discipline and correct the behavior of a rebellious child. In, in Titus chapter 2 verse 4, it uses a specific word to highlight the special kind of love a mother has for her child. You know, this, among many other different verses throughout the Old and New Testament, shows the inherent ways a mother should act. And, and, and so when Deborah says, I was a mother in Israel, what she's trying to do is show us how she operated as a judge. She wanted us to know she is a mama bear rising up to defend her children, but she was also a mother who came to correct her disobedient kids and set them on the right path once more. And I think that's pretty cool, but, but that's not the only place where a mother figure is, is in this story. You see, um, if you look at JL closely enough, you'll find that JL is also kind of a motherly figure of sorts too, right? Um, just think about the way that she deals with Cicero when he shows up on her doorstep, right? He runs from the, the people of Israel. He shows up at her door and, and he asks her for help. So what does she do? Well, she tucks the guy in for a nap, right? Let's just read it. Look in verses 19 and 20. He said to her, please give me a little water to drink for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent. And if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. Right, he he's wants a, a, a glass of water because he's tired, and and so she goes above and beyond, and she gives him milk, and she says, "Hey, lay down," and she gives him a blanket. She tucks the guy in, and, and then you know he wants her to stay up with him and to watch over him and protect him until he falls asleep. He's scared, not of monsters in the closet, but of Israelites who are on their way to come and get him, and so she's like, "Yes, I'll do that." Now, granted. After she tucks him in, that's about the moment that the motherly aspect falls apart. But still, right? you got to admit that the way she treats him at first is reminiscent of a mother, right? I remember my mom tucking me in. She would sing, you are my sunshine, and run her hands through my hair. Like, that's what that whole scene reminds me of, right? Now, there's that, and, and, and then that's not even the end of the motherly figures showing up in this story. If you look towards the end of chapter 5 and verse 28, it gives us yet another mom to look at. It says this, it says, Out of the window she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? 
Right, so at the end of this story, you know, we, we don't know if this was a real thing that Sisera's mother said or if it's something that Deborah put in for just kind of, um, you know, just uh, her own little touch. But it's kind of a story where Deborah imagines the way Sisera's mother would be waiting for him at the end of this battle, expecting him to come home, wondering, hey, why is he taking so long to get here? Why hasn't he come back? So she asks this question, what's taking so long? And then in verses 29 and 30, we get the imagined answer. It says that her wisest princesses answer, indeed, she answers herself. Have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb or two for every man. Spoil of divide, dyed materials for Sisera, spoil of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. So she asks, where is Sisera? They answer and they tell themselves, listen, the reason he has not got home yet is probably just because he's having a party with the boys. They're probably just dividing up the spoils of war. That's probably what's key. That's probably why he isn't here yet. Now, you might be wondering, okay, cool. So there's moms in the story, but what, what does that mean? You know, what is the point of this Easter egg? What is the deeper truth it's trying to point us to? Well, I think it starts to un- the un- unravel here, if you look in verse 30 and, and just pay special attention to what the spoils of war are described to be in verse 30. Right? The spoils of war described by Sisera's mother and her wisest princesses are this, a womb or two for every man. Now, I don't want to get into detail. I don't want to give this any more time than I have to, but suffice it to say what was happening is that Cicero was well known. Cicero and his men were well known after defeating and conquering an enemy to take women as sex slaves for themselves. Right? So he was taking women from their homes as a prize to do whatever he wanted with them. It's just disgusting and horrifying. He was a wicked dude. And so were the men that followed him. And then they mentioned, too, the dyed materials for Cicero. So they were thinking to themselves, oh, he's probably just taking his time, going through all the spoils, finding all the best best clothes. You, You know how he likes to be stylish. You know Cicero's fashion, right? And you got to ask, like, why are all these details put into this verse here? Well, I think it paints a picture for us. And I think whenever you look at Sisera's mom, it it paints a picture of a woman who condoned the dark deeds of her son. It makes Sisera out to be some kind of mama's boy who is able to get away with anything that he wanted because mama just wanted him to be happy. See, and I think that the way that the book of Judges works and just the, the different things they invite us to do in this book as we read it, I think among those things is this, this detail is put in here because it's begging us to compare the mother of Israel, Deborah, with the, the mother of Sisera. If you look at these two different kinds of mothers and you compare and you contrast them, you would see that Deborah, the mother in Israel, rose up as a mother to her people and she called upon the sons of Israel to shape up and to step out in faith and to do what was right. And then you look at Sisera and and, and you find that she knew about the sins that her son was committing and she allowed them to continue saying nothing, doing nothing to try and correct his sins. Just let him do it. And you know what? JL, if you look at her as a motherly figure, you'll find JL took advantage of this mama's boy and she lulled him. She used that to lull him into a false sense of security that resulted in his death. And it made Sisera's mother out to be the bitter woman that's described in Proverbs 17, verse 25. Proverbs 17, 25 says, A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. And so I think that this little Easter egg that's embedded within this story of uh, Deborah, Barak, Jael, and Sisera is meant to to highlight two things. I I think the first thing that this little Easter egg is meant to highlight for us is this. Uh, Moms, you matter. The influence you have upon your children matters. It it really does. Like, just think about Sisera. Just think, if only he had a mom who loved him enough to discipline him to do what was right instead of just doing whatever he wanted, how would this story have been different if Sisera's mom had just been the mom he needed? Not just a mama bear, but a mom who was going to call her son to obedience. 
this story would look a lot different. And so I think that's definitely something that we can pick up from this story. And another thing that I think we can see in this story is, is listen, mom, don't give up. Right? Don't give up on your kids. Keep loving them. Keep disciplining them. Keep guiding and teaching them. Paul tells us in Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I think we can apply this to motherhood and to raising children. We have Proverbs 22, 6 to kind of back that up. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And why is that true? Because Paul tells us in Philippians 2.13 that it is God who works in you and in your children both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is no guarantee that you moms will be able to, to make sure your kids will grow up and follow Jesus. But what the Bible is promising here is that if you will be um, consistent, if you do not give up and continue to teach and to train and to guide your children, that at the very least, your children will know the difference between right and wrong and that knowledge will haunt them to the end of their days and they will not be able to do what Sisera did. Not in the same way. And so again, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot going on here, but I think those are at least two things that we can learn from this story in this little Easter egg. I think this little Easter egg about uh, moms in the, the director's commentary here shows us how God used a mom to speak to his people and to save them from themselves. And I think that he can do the same thing with you in the lives of your children. So again, thank you, moms, and happy Mother's Day. But moving on with this story, there's at least one more thing that Deborah shares with us in the director's cut, the director's commentary of uh, this story. If you turn to uh, chapter th- or to verse 13, and we'll read verses 13 through 18, it says this. It says, Then down marched the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim, their route, they marched down into the valley, following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Mahir, marched down the commanders, and from Zebulon, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah, and Issachar faithful to Barak. Into the valley, they rushed at his heels among the clans of Reuben. There were great searchings of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. Zebulon is a people who risked their lives to the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. So, so we learned early in the story that Deborah had called the people of God to go out in battle against Sisera. But here in verses 13 through 18, or through 18, we find that there were some of the tribes of Israel that responded to her call willingly. But at the same time, there were others who ignored this call. We find, as you read through this, that Ephraim, Benjamin, Zebulon, Issachar, uh, Mahir, which is just another name for the tribe of Manasseh, and the tribe of Naphtali, that all of them, whenever Deborah called, they were the ones who willingly came and responded to this call. But then, um, and and, uh, she gives special notice to Zebulon and Naphtali. Um, But then the tribes of Reuben, Gad, Dan, and Asher, they ignored the call that God put upon the tribes of Israel. They stayed home. They, they didn't come. They didn't join the fight. Um, now, now, this um, may seem like a, a detail that you would maybe just read through, but, but upon closer examination, you'll find that this was a big deal. Right? Because he, here's the bottom line. Okay, um, Yes, Deborah acted as a mother to Israel. She is a mom. Um, but, but this wasn't Deborah asking her kiddos to do some chores. You see, Deborah was also a prophetess which means that she acted as the very voice of God. She spoke his words to his people on his behalf when he asked her to. And so when she gave the call and they did not answer that call, they were not just ignoring her. They were ignoring the very voice of God. They were, they were, she was asking them to put their faith in God, to pledge their allegiance to him and to step out in faith and fight. And so when they refused to answer Deborah's call, they were not just refusing Deborah's call, they were rejecting God's authority in their lives. And you know what? That is at its core the definition of sin, is, is rejecting God's authority over you. 
right? And, and, and that's a very dangerous thing to do. The scripture tells us to sin is to incur death. To, to sin and to rebel against God and reject his authority in your life is death. It is a curse. And, and that is exactly what was going on. And if you look at verse 23, it kind of fleshes this idea out. In verse 23, it says, Curse marrows, says the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. And Marrows was likely a town that was nearby who received the summons to come and fight and yet chose not to, and so they receive a curse from the angel of the Lord. Now, the opposite is also true. If, if um, um, you know, this was a rejection of God's authority in their life, then you could say that faith is receiving God's authority into your life. In fact, in Greek, the word uh, pistis, which is uh, uh, translated as faith in English, is officially defined as conviction, commitment, faithfulness, trust, or fidelity to someone or something. In short, faith is more than fire insurance. Faith means pledging your allegiance to and receiving the authority of Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. And that is, make no mistake, that is exactly what the Israelites were being called to do when Deborah issued the summons to come into battle. And so when they rejected that call, they refused God's authority over them and incurred a curse upon themselves. But for those who did answer the call, those who did receive God's authority into their life, like Jael did, they received a blessing. I think about um, verse 24. It talks about what Jael got for her faith, for her allegiance given to God. It says, most blessed of women be Jael the wife of Heber, the Kenite of tent-dwelling women most blessed. It tells us that she received a blessing for her obedience. It's just like it says in Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 through 28. It says, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but you turn aside from the way that I'm commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. The idea here is if you accept God's authority in your life, you get blessing, and if you reject it, you get the curse. And and that same choice is given to us today, only it has to do with whether we're going to believe the gospel or not. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That verse is telling us that if you believe in the gospel, you put your faith in Jesus, you pledge your allegiance to him, that you receive a blessing that is sealed by the Holy Spirit. But if you reject him, then you remain under the curse of sin. See, Deborah called upon the people to help in a fight, but it was about more than a battle. It was about who they put their faith in, who they were going to pledge allegiance to. And so I I guess that's as good a place as any to tell you about the choice that's before you. You see, the gospel is a message that God has given to each and every one of us. The, The word gospel means good news. And it's the news that though the world has fallen to sin and every last one of us deserves death because of that, that our king, his name is Jesus, has come and he's offered to us the opportunity to pledge allegiance to him. And if we pledge allegiance to him, we get the blessing. If we put our faith in him, if we trust him, if we accept his authority in our lives, he will rescue us from sin. He's already paid the debt that we owed, the death that was rightly ours. He paid for it in his body on the cross and then rose again to new life and said, if you pledge allegiance to me, if you put your trust in me, then I will save you as he who has conquered death. See, we, we're given the exact same choice here. God is calling you right here, right now, to allow God to have authority in your life. And if you allow him to do that, if you put your trust in him, he will save you. And I am telling you, it is every last one of us. If you think that you can do good on your own, in your own strength, and earn your way into God's kingdom, that's not how this works. Sin is too dark. Sin is too depraved. You are too broken, just like I was before I knew Christ. The only salvation that you have is to cast yourself upon Jesus Christ. The only 
recourse for you if you want salvation is to trust him with everything that you've got. And so that's my call for you. Like Deborah, I want to be a voice that calls you to make a choice. Today, give your life to Christ. Trust him. If you want help in doing that and you just need a little bit more information, please contact us. You comment in the video, email me at brian at riochurch.net. Do something, anything, but I'm telling you, you've got to make a choice. Make that choice today. He is our king. He is our God. He's called for us to make a choice. So let's do it. I love you guys, and, and I'm glad that we got to come back uh, to, to our study in Judges. And, and um, I, I do still long for the day we can meet together in person. But um, between now and then, I'm glad that we get to do this. And just want to let you know we're going to be doing this again next week. We'll be all online again next week. So um, make sure you plan for that. Invite a friend. Send the link out to somebody, whatever it may be. But um, between now and next week, as always, I want to send you out from this time and call you to love God, love others, and make disciples who do the same. Love you guys. See you next time. Drawing close.
fostered by grace and all oh, now it's yours so fear removed i breathe you in i lean into Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. On a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of.
Yes, Oreos! Oh, so oh, excited. Wait. What? I wanted that cookie. But I want the cookies. But I really want the cookies. <sighs> do I give her the cookie? Or do I eat the cookie? some help with this decision. This is going to be a difficult decision. I just don't know if I Who are you? Come on, dude. You know who I am, man. You, 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 know, you know who I am. Are, you're not the devil, are you? <laughs> you should eat the cookie. Um, why are your horns so shiny? Right, right, right here, there's it's a cookie. And, yeah? And never mind about my shiny horns. It's the, the just... They'll get used to them, okay? Just, there's a cookie, uh -huh. and it's yours. I mean, it should be yours. You deserve it. I mean, you worked really hard today. I mean, what yeah. did she even do yeah. to deserve this? I mean, that, you don't... Listen, man, you're the king of the cookies. This is your... I am rifle. the king of the cookies. You're the king of the cookies. Yeah. Yeah. I think... You might be right, Devil. I think I should just eat the cookie. You should eat the cookie. Yeah, I think I think I should eat the cookie, but... <laughs> but... I, I ref but some, way, some, I, some tell me that's... Not a good idea, though. Ah, don't worry about that. Oh, this is a difficult decision. Uh, sons tell me that. Hey, man. Hey, Jesus. Hey, man. What do you think you should do? Um. Well, I want to eat the cookie. You should definitely eat the cookie. What are you doing here? I just came to hang out. Then ignore him. Share cookies. What would I do, Devil? <clears throat> What would what would Jesus do? I mean, what would I do? Uh, it doesn't really matter what Jesus would do. To, I mean, does it really matter what Jesus would do? Okay, uh, I mean, I mean, he. I mean, those bracelets are so outdated. So. But but <laughs> I mean, he wrote the Bible, right? I mean, the listen, Bible. Dev, devil, devil, three. Uh, two. Listen, you should definitely. Two. Okay. Wow, that was that that was amazing, Jesus. You know, it's what I do. Oh, cool. But um, let's think about what you were thinking about doing. Okay. What, what would I do? What, what would, what's biblical right now? Uh, you'd probably say I should, you know, give the cookie to somebody else. You know, think of right. somebody else first. Yeah, put someone else first. <sighs> but I really want the cookie. I know. Sometimes, you know, it's, sometimes they're not decisions that we want. But it's what we ought to do. Okay. You got this? Yeah, man. Yeah? You give me a high five. All right. All right. All right. I got, yeah. Thank, okay. Jesus, thank you. I awesome. got this. Okay. All right. You got this. I'm going to do the right okay, thing. Okay, you got this. All right, cool. All right. Man, Jesus is a nice guy. All right. All right. I know what I'm going to do now. I know what I'm going to do. All right. All right. I know what I'm going to do. All right. You know what? Here. You can, really? have last, you can have the last cookies. Are you sure? It's hard, but yeah, it's it's what Jesus would do. Oh, it's really nice, Paul. I really appreciate that. No problem. I love you, and you know, it's like I said, it's what Jesus would do. So. Thanks. It means a lot more than you think it does. Awesome. Love okay. you. Love you, too. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Rio Kids segment of the video. So glad you guys are here. I really hope you enjoy that skit we did in the beginning. We made it just for you. So let's go ahead and jump into our lesson and remember that skit. Remember what we just did in that skit, how we put somebody else before ourselves because that's what we're going to be talking about today. 
So as you guys know, we're still in the book of Luke. So I want you guys to pick up your Bibles. I want you guys to jump to the book of Luke. I want you guys to go to chapter 14. So big number 14. And we're going to start in verse 8. And to give you guys a bit of background before we jump in, this is another parable or story that Jesus is giving us to explain something really important. So I'm going to go ahead and read, and you'll see how it all connects. All right, so verse 8 says, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you, who's invited by the host, uh, he who invites you both, the host will come and he will say to you, give your place to this person, and then you'll begin with shame to take the lower spot. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when the host comes and says to you, friend, you should move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all those who sit at the table with you. For everyone who lifts himself up will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be lifted up. So what Jesus is saying is here is pretty simple. He's giving us this story of a, of a wedding feast, like a, like a party. And back then, if you were at the very, very end, the low section of the table, that's some, some place not very honorable. That's not really a great place to be. But up at the, at the end of the table near the host, that's the best place to be. That's the most honorable spot at the table. And what he's telling us is that, you know, in this example, don't, don't go and, and place yourself in the best spot. Don't put yourself in the best place at the table because then somebody can come and say, hey, this spot's somebody else's. You should go sit at the back. And then you go and you you have to kind of walk all, you know, with your head down like like this and, and, you know, awkwardly walk down to the worst spot. But if you put yourself, if you humble yourself, if you put others before you, if you put others first and you put yourself second and you sit at the lowest spot of the table, then the host will come to you and he will bring you up into a better spot. What Jesus is saying is, is pretty clear is that we should be putting other people before ourselves, no matter what it is. And we don't have to be worried about getting the best things all the time or missing out. Because when we put others first, God sees that and it makes God very happy. It makes God happy because that's what God would do. You see, God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us, Jesus. It says in the scriptures that he left his royalty, he left his, his power as God, and he came down in the form of a man. It actually said that he came and was born as a baby. So God showed us that, that by his love that we should be like him. And the best way to be like him is to put ourselves second, put somebody else first. And you may be wondering, well, how do I do that? Well, it's easy. Remember the skit that we did in the beginning? You remember about the cookie? It's so easy in just the littlest of things to put somebody else first, whether that's your mom or your dad, your grandma, your grandpa, or maybe it's your brother or your sister. It doesn't matter who it is. Maybe it's a friend at school. Maybe when you start school again, whoever it may be, find little ways that you can put somebody else first. Let them play with the toy first. Let them choose the, the, the video to watch. Let them have the, the last cookie. Whatever it may be, do our best to follow Jesus and to put others before ourselves. That's my challenge for you guys this week. I want you guys to, to pray about it. I want you guys to, to look, keep your eyes open for little ways you can put other people first. Sound like a plan? All right, let's go ahead and pray. I want everybody to bow their, head, uh, bow their heads and close their eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to, to be like you. Help us, Lord, to love others and to put them first. Let us not always think about me, me, me all the time. But God, I pray that we would think about other people and we would not give in to the me monster, but instead we would show love just like you did. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Have a great day. Bye-bye.